Welcome, everyone. Brukim Habaim. Thank you for coming out tonight. We're glad you're here. This is Yom Azikaron, a day of remembrance, a day in which we commemorate Israel's fallen soldiers, those who have died, Al Kiddush Hashem, defending our Holy Land. And to help us with this task, we've invited Lehi Peretz to address us. Lehi is one of our Shinshinim. These are young Israelis who are embedded in communities all over the country. And we are lucky that Lehi not only teaches in the Bernard Zell on Shama Day School, but she also teaches here in our religious school. And it gives young people a chance to get to know Israelis. And these are very, as you will hear, very special young people. So Lehi, would you come up and share your perspective on Yom Hazikaron with us tonight? Thank you, everyone. Um, my name is Lee uh, Peretz. I am from Israel. Um, I'm pushing my army in one year, and then I'm coming here, joining the Jewish community in Chicago. Afterwards, I'm going to go to the army. I'm going to be a paramedic in the army. And I reached out to the synagogue and asked them if they have anything they do on Yom Hazikaron, because I wanted to be joining any ceremony of a sort that will they were going to do. And they told me that they would love me to come and to tell about my Yom HaZikaron. So Yom HaZikaron is a day that we remember all the soldiers and all the people, civilians, who died in terrorist attack. And it's a day, and us as Israelis, we hear music about Yom HaZikaron for the entire day, and those are really, really sad songs, because you're going to hear one of them. And I was thinking what it is Yom HaZikaron for me. So Yom HaZikaron starts today and it starts with a siren. It's a loud noise going all throughout Israel. It starts at 8 p.m. Everybody bows their heads and they think about the fallen soldiers and the civilian who died in order for us to, to walk on the land we're walking. And then the, the next day, we're going to schools, we're going to our kindergartens, to the army, some of us, to the workplaces, and in every place there is a ceremony. Doesn't matter what age you are, even if you're in a kindergarten kit, you will find something they will tell you about that day. And this year, being so far away from home, I got a text from my teacher, and she sent it out the invitation for the, the ceremony in my high school. And I was surprised, like, I'm no longer in the high school. Why is she sending the invitation out? And it's a tradition in every school all throughout Israel to send an invitation to the people who graduated the high school. So they will come with their uniforms on or with whatever they are wearing to show what they are doing now in their lives. And I remember last year uh, seeing the, the graduators coming to my high school and the teacher filled with pride. Um, over the kids wearing the uniforms and telling about the, what they are doing in the army. And the day goes on and we go into the ceremony. The ceremony always starts around 9.30 because at 10.30 there is another siren. And the families who lost their loved ones are coming to the ceremonies and every school with the names of the students that were in his school. And every city is doing a ceremony of their own, and they are reading all the names. And I am really sad to say it's a very long list. And the day goes on, and officers in the army are each of them getting a headstone to go and put a rock on the headstone. So no soldier who died for the country will ever be left alone on that day. And we are hugging the families, and we are talking about it. And we're doing the ceremony, and we're hearing the siren, and we're really thinking about our loved ones. 
And then around somewhere around 5 p.m., the day shifts. Yom Atzmaut comes, and it's a big celebration. And in my youth movement, every time we talk about the fact that those days are so close, how can we do it so close? Like it's from one very sad thing to something very happy. We're celebrating the fact that we are independent and we can walk on our country freely. And every time there's a big debate and we are all in the end coming to the same conclusion. Uh, it's a sentence in Hebrew. Uh, you say, which means in English, in their death, they ordered us to live. And that's why we, for me, at least we celebrate Yom Atzmaut so close. Because if they didn't die, and if they haven't given us their lives and their serv service, we wouldn't be able to walk on the country and walk on the land freely. And they didn't want, us, they didn't want to die and us to always mourn on them and be sad. They want us to die, they died for us to live, to go to our schools, to study something new, to smile and sing and be happy. And so on that day, Yom Atzmaut, we celebrate them. We celebrate the fact that they died for us to walk and be happy. And there is another saying in Israel, in Israel which is also a very sad one. Everybody knows somebody. Kol echad makir mishu. And the sentence goes on. Anybody knows a person who died for the country, a soldier that died, any, a person who died in a terrorist attack. And even today, there was a terrorist attack on Yom Zikaron. And just a cycle, that, a vicious cycle that keeps going on. And I want to tell you a story about me. So when I was a little kid, I would I love bikes. And I would bike with my dad all around Rosh Hanikra. So I live in Naria. Naria is on the north side of Israel, next to Lebanon. And Rosh Hanikra is really in the tiptoe of that area. And we would bike all over, and then we always go to the same monument. We like, we'll see it on our trail. And the monument is for Benjamin Yonasi, Benji Yonasi. And I would ask my dad, why is there so many flowers here? Like, what is this thing? Uh, why is there a headstone all over, like, next to the sea? It doesn't make any sense. And he told me that he's a head, it, I was a little kid, so he told me it's a headstone of the son of his friend that died one day from a rocket. It was very short, I was a kid, didn't want to make me worry about anything. And then I moved on with my life, as all of us do, and I moved on with my life. I got to my high school year, and in my high school year, I got to be a senior. As anybody, I finished my high school, and I was asked to go to a running competition. Now, I'm not a runner. I do not like to run. And they told, my, told all of us we we're going to go on a running competition in the memory of Benji, Benji Yonasi. And after running for such a long time, seven and a half uh, miles, um, we got from Rosh Hanikra to our high school again. And when we got there, they told us his story. So they started telling us the story. He went for, he, he made Aliyah from Iran when he was three years old with his family. And he got to Naria, and he lived in Naria, and he was a smart kid. And he, he had a beautiful voice, and his teacher really convinced him to be part of the choir because he was a very shy kid. And then he became part of the choir, and he was a beautiful singer, and he loved physics, and he loved math. And his favorite sports were tennis and basketball and soccer. And then he's, he got to his high school, which is my high school also. And he studied physics and chemistry and math and English. And his life was ahead of him. He was an amazing kid, a very smart kid. And the story goes on. And so in his last year, senior year, like any senior in Israel, we are all worried about the army. What are we going to do? What am I, what's going to be my job? Am I going to have fun? And Veggie was really on it. He knew what he's going to do. He tried tests that he became, he got a job to be a Navy commander. And he also studied for, um, for the university because he wanted to be in the university after the army. And he got a, a scholarship to learn economics. His life was ahead of him. And he had one last test in high school he had to do his P finals. 
And the trail to the PE finals was from Rosh Hashanah, the 7.5 miles that I needed to run. And in the end, was proudly to run them. He needed to do the same trail. And every Friday, he would take his dad to that trail to do the trail to practice for his PE finals. And his school tells that he was a wonderful kid. I know his teacher. And I met his parents. And he told everybody, I'm going to be a commander. I'm going to be finishing high school in the best score ever. And I'm going to succeed in PE also. So on the 31 of March, he did the trail again. His father drove him all the way to Washington. And he started running. He set a clock. He set a timer. And he started running. And his father walked, drove next to him with the car just to drive next to him to keep him company. And me trail, he tells his father, go home. I don't know what you're doing. You don't need to be here. It's Friday. Go home, go back. I will come back. Don't worry about me. I'm going to come back. So his father has leave, left him. He drove, drove back home. Benji kept running. 50 minutes after um, he kept running and his father left him, rockets started falling all over the north side. And one of the rockets landed on him and killed him. And he never made it back home. And his family wanted people to remember him as they wanted him to, rem to be remembered as a person who was happy and was athletic and loved sports. And so every year they take the seniors in my high school and we're doing the same trail as he did. We're talking about him, we're meeting his parents. And... They give us trophies for the winners, but that doesn't really matter to us because in the end we find, we get to know who is Benji. And stories like Benji, there are so many, like countless. I know more and more every year. And I wanted to share with you a song that I really love, which is about another fallen soldier. And this song is about a person named Sean. Now, Sean died um, I believe 15 years ago and how he died is another very sad story but I'm not going to tell you that he was supposed to go to he got, got to Gaza and he got into Gaza and he never came back and when they opened his phone um, they got into the notes apps, uh, a note app and he, they saw letters he left for his family so some, something in Sean made him think that he's not going to come back from that fight. And a singer, a really known singer, Hanan ben Ari in Israel, took all the notes uh, he wrote and created a song about him. And the song called Laila Tov Sean, which in English transferred transfer to Good Night Sean, because in his last note he said, if I didn't came back, that means I probably went to sleep. And so I would like to share a song with you. I love you, really. מהכניסה לעזה או משהו בבקשה תהיי חזקה בשבילי ואם יקרה לי משהו תחייכי בגאווה אני אוהב אותך אוהב אותך אוהב אותך אוהב אותך אוהב אותך אוהב אותך, אבא, היית אבא נפלא באמת, אבא, גבר גבר, למרות שרבנו בחודש האחרון, אל תייחס לזה משמעות, אני אוהב אותך. אוהב אותך, אוהב אותך, אוהב אותך, אוהב אותך, אוהב אותך, 
Powerful words. I'm inviting Avi Porat forward. Avi served in the IDF. He defended Midinat Israel with great bravery and courage and lost a number of good friends along the way. I invited him to light a candle. If we were in Israel today, we would hear a siren. And when we would hear that siren, if we were driving our car, we would stop and stand and get out of our car. If we're walking down the street, we would stop. I'm going to invite everyone to rise as we remember 24,213 souls who died al Kiddush Hashem. Shochein bam romi Hamse menucha nechona Tachat kanfe ashchina Bemalot kidoshim teorim vegeborim Kezor araki
ויצרור בצרור החיים את נשמותיהם, אדוני הוא נחלתם. ואנו בשלום על משכבותיהם. Exalted and compassionate God, <laughs> grant perfect rest to the souls of all the soldiers of Israel who gave their lives for the sanctification of your name. May they find a place under the wings of the divine presence among the holy and the pure. May Jews throughout the world honor the memory of all those who fell in defense of the state of Israel in all the battles for the formation of the state and in all her wars, and for all our brothers and sisters who fell victim to acts of violence and terror. May their souls be bound up in the bond of eternal life, and let us say, Amen. Amen. We'll turn together to say Kaddish Shatom, Mourner's Kaddish. If you'd like to follow along in your Siddur, there are Siddurs in the back pocket on page 30, or you can just join us aloud. Yitgadal ve Yitgadash me Rabba Beoma divra kirte viamlich malchute Bechayechon of Yomechon of Haye de Hobet Israel Ba Agala of Isman Kari vimru Amen Yehesh me Rabba Mavarach Leolam o me o Maya Yit Barach vishta bach vit paar Yitramam vit nasse Vita dar vita le vita la Shikme de Kudsha brihu Laela min kol berchata veshirata, tush bechata venechamata, da amiran beoma vimru amen. Yehe shlama rabba min shemaya, the chayim alenu vel kol Yisrael vimru amen. O se shalom bimromav, hu ya ase shalom alenu vel kol Yisrael vimru amen. I It is a pleasure to welcome our good friend Yossi Klein Halevi to the Anshiamit Synagogue again. He was here 10 years ago, and we are so proud to welcome him back. And I want to thank Charlene Elion for generously making this evening possible. On this evening of remembrance, we think of her beloved husband, Dr. Pierre Elion. Zecher Sadiq Livracha. 
May his name be remembered as a blessing. I can't think of anyone who I'd rather be talking about Israel with at this moment in time than our guest, Yessi Klein Halevi. Not only because of his expansive knowledge, but the passion that he brings, the intelligence that he shares, the perspective that he brings, but also his menschlichkeit. I'm proud to call Yessi a friend. So let me tell you just a bit about him and then we'll begin. Yessi Klein Halevi is a senior fellow at the Shalom Hartman Institute in Jerusalem. And together with Imam Abdullah Antepli of Duke University, he co-directs the Institute's Muslim Leadership Initiative, which teaches emerging young Muslim American leaders about Judaism, Jewish identity, and Israel. Yessi's 2013 book, Life's Dreamers, won the Jewish Book Council's Everett Book of the Year Award. His latest book, Letters to My Palestinian Neighbor, is a New York Times bestseller. He writes for leading op-ed pages in the United States, including the Times, the Wall Street Journal, and is a contributing editor to the New Republic. His 2001 book, At the Entrance of the Garden of Eden, A Jew's Search for God with Christians and Muslims in the Holy Land, will be reissued in 2019 by HarperCollins, and I urge you to read it. His first book, Memoirs of a Jewish Extremist, tells the story of his teenage years as a follower of Rabbi Meir Kahana and his subsequent disillusionment with Jewish radicalism. The New York Times called it a book of burning importance. In 2013, he was visiting professor of Israel studies at the Jewish Theological Seminary. He served as a writer in residence at the University of Illinois. He was a senior fellow at Shalem Center in Jerusalem from 2004 to 2010. Born in Brooklyn, he moved to Israel in 1982, which happens to be the year that I came to Anshiamet. And he lives in Jerusalem with his wife, Sarah. But they are presently taking up residence in Vancouver because they have been blessed with their first grandchild. So on behalf of all of us, mazel tov. Thank you. Temporary residence. (laughs) Okay. Now, we are gathered on Yom HaZikaron sacred day in the land of Israel, when people stop and reflect on Israel's fallen. So I'd like to begin tonight by giving you a moment to reflect on this Yom HaZikaron as, Israel's, as Israel prepares to celebrate its 75th year since declaring statehood in 1948. So first of all, Rabbi, I, I'm honored to be with you on your 40th, on my 40th, and uh, delighted to be back with all of you. This is a um, a particularly wrenching um, Yom HaZikaron because in addition to the raw pain that everyone in Israel feels, and as Lee so beautifully put it, everyone knows someone. And the mourning in Israel is always personal, but this particular uh, Yom HaZikaron is overshadowed by really an existential question, which is, uh, can we still continue to come together <clears throat> in mourning and the next day in celebration? And it's an open question this year. And that's what makes this so painful. I believe that the long-term answer is yes, but I'm not so sure about this particular moment. And so in that sense, you know, 40 years in Israel is, is several lifetimes. And you go through whatever the Middle East can throw at you, 
But this is more painful, I think, than anything that I feel that I've gone through. And the reason for that is because this is internal. This is self-inflicted. And this really touches uh, at the, the, the root of, uh, of who we are and what our strength has been. Our strength has been our ability to come together. And that's what's being tested today. You're an op-ed piece in the Globe and Mail entitled, Israelis have turned against each other. Will the country hold together? And in the article, you quoted David Grossman, who said at one of the Saturday night rallies, the state of Israel was established so that there would be one place in the world where the Jewish person, the Jewish people, would feel at home. But if so many Israelis feel like exiles in their own country, then clearly something has gone wrong. You then continue. The sphere of schism runs deep. In Jewish memory, loss of national sovereignty is invariably preceded by internal disintegration. And then you talk about some of those moments when Israel split apart after King Solomon's death, when the Assyrian Empire arose in 722, when <clears throat> Dia was, de, was exiled by Babylonia, when reconstituted Judea was destroyed by Rome in 70. What makes this moment especially fraught is that for the first time in Israel's history, a governing coalition is attempting to simultaneously transform the meaning of the nation's two foundational identities as a Jewish and a democratic state. The result is a society more divided than at any time since the bitter debate around the Oslo Peace Accords process of the early 1990s, culminating in the assassination by a far-right activist of Prime Minister Yitzhak Rabin. This article was written on February 3rd, which, reflecting on the Israeli news cycle, feels like a lifetime ago. That's, that's what I felt listening to it. <laughs> <laughs> Are you feeling more or less hopeful three months later? Yes. <laughs> <clears throat> okay. And, and I mean that. And, and it's interesting because I wonder if Grossman would have written, would have said those words in quite the same way today. Because what's happened for those of us who have been out on the streets week after week <clears throat> is that we've discovered a very large community. And I don't think that any of us feel like exiles in, uh, in our own home. <clears throat> I think that what has surprised us is how extraordinarily vibrant uh, centrist liberal Israel has become. I think we surprised ourselves. We didn't, we didn't think we really had it in us. We didn't think we had the passion of the right or of the far left. And we've discovered that the center in Israel and, and the demonstrations that are happening today, by and large, are, it's not coming from the left because there's hardly any left left. It's the center. It's the center versus the right. That's the political map in Israel today. And the center has found itself. It's found its voice and its, its power. And so that's the good news. The good news is when I stand in these demonstrations, I look around and I know that everyone, hundreds of thousands of people, are going through exactly what I'm going through. The insomnia, the rage, the fear, uh, the mourning. There's this, uh, the, the, the Israeli novelist Eshkol Nevo uh, wrote recently that he finds himself in a traffic jam in Tel Aviv, alone in his car, weeping. And this sense of this fear that the Israel that we knew and loved is being, God forbid, is being lost. And, and so you, you feel everyone around you going through that same trajectory, that same emotional process, and it gives you great strength, and you realize that your camp is so central, so, in, um, so much a part of the Israeli experience. So that's the good news. 
The bad news is that since I wrote that, the divide has deepened. And it's deepened in part because we're not taking it. We're not, we're not, we're, we're, we're not, we're not doing what centrists usually do, which is get along. And we've become militant centrists. And so you have two militant camps in Israel today facing each other. You have a hard right, and you have an equally implacable center. And this is new. It's very dangerous, because it means that the, the, the schism is much more intense when it's coming from both sides, and it is. But it also gives me a great deal of hope, because I think we're going to win. I think, we, I think in the end, uh, we will have the majority of Israel with us, and the polls already show that. The government is in free fall in the polls. The latest poll showed that the, the coalition, if elections were held today, would go from 64 seats to 48. I've never seen polls like that in 40 years in Israel. In four months, this government is in power all of four months, and it is hemorrhaging support from the soft right. The hard right is through fire and water. The soft right does not like what's happening and feels that uh, Netanyahu and the Likud misled them because this was not, this, this judicial revolution was not front and center in the election campaign. Uh, the Likud talked about security. Well, security is far worse than it was under the last government. And all this government seems to be focused on is this issue. So many Israeli voters of the Likud feel that this isn't what they signed up for. And one of the, one of the remarkable <clears throat> features of these protests is the use of the Israeli flag. A good friend, Lital Rosenberg, told me a story on <clears throat> Good Shabbos and Kiddush. And the story is that I think it was a relative of yours you were speaking to as one of the protests, and she was walking home. And she saw someone coming up the street towards her who was uh, wearing whatever paraphernalia would lead her to believe that he was go the person was going to a counter-protest. And the person approached her as she was walking. And she became agitated. And the person walked up to her and said, can I have your flag? So think about that for a minute. First of all, think about an American <clears throat> protest. Some people in this country march with American flags. And that is a signal to another group in this country. Right? Here, in this moment, everyone is carrying the flag of Israel. Now, see, what does that mean? What do you, how do you understand that? Give us the Rashi on that. So I, I, I love the story. I, um, my response again is uh, I'm, I'm optimistic and pessimistic in relation to that story. Uh, pessimistic, I'll start with the bad news. Pessimistic because I don't think that that is typical of what's happening in Israel today. I wish it were. The truth is that there is such deep enmity on both sides that that is a precious but rare encounter. More often what you'll see on the streets is verbal violence and occasionally actual violence. The other side of that though is exactly what you're saying, is that the good news about Israel is the flag does not just belong to the right, which I think is part of the tragedy of the American political discourse, is that one side has appropriated the flag. In Israel, the flag belongs to everybody. And it's extraordinary that the symbol of the protest movement is the Israeli flag. Mm -hmm. And this is not wokeism. There is, there's virtually no wokeism in Israel, even on the left. Maybe you'll find a little bit. But in the, cent the center, doesn't know what woke is. And what this movement is, 
is an eruption of patriotism. It is a, a vehement critique of the government as violating, as desecrating everything that we hold dear and love about, about Israel and Zionism. This is an affirmation. So yes, it's a protest, but it's a very particular kind of protest. So what's the demography of the protests and then the counter protests? Can you give us some sense of who's marching? Is it Mizrahi on one side, Ashkenazi on another? How would you understand it? So that's, that's what Netanyahu would like to portray this as. It's certainly true that a majority of the demonstrators seem to be, uh, seem to, uh, of the anti-government demonstrators, uh, I would say are Ashkenazi, although it varies from city to city. In Tel Aviv, it is strongly Ashkenazi, secular, liberal. Jerusalem is half religious. The demonstrations are, are easily half kippot. Uh, and we have, you know, the demonstrations in Jerusalem are nowhere near as, as big as they are in Tel Aviv, but we have 10,000, sometimes 20,000 people on a Saturday night. Uh, there are demonstrations are at 160 locations all over the country, so that in the aggregate you probably have on any Saturday night between four to 500,000 people out in the streets. You can do the arithmetic in, the, in an American context and see we're really talking about a phenomenon. Uh, the, um, there's, there's a weekly demonstration in the settlement of Efrat in Gush Etzion. It's not large, it's maybe two, 300 people every week, but that's a statement. And the statement is, this is, this is an eruption of, of the Israeli center, and by the center I mean the democratic right as opposed to the far right, and the center and, and the left. And when I use the term liberal, I think this is really important to say to an American audience. Liberal in Israel does not quite mean liberal in America. It works differently in Israel. Menachem Begin was one of the country's greatest liberal leaders. He happened to also be right wing. But if I have to think of which leader embodied the democratic principles, the liberal principles of pluralism, tolerance, it was Begin more than Ben-Gurion. Ben-Gurion used the Shin Bet to spy on political rivals. Menachem Begin would have never done that. And there's one famous story about Begin. When the government ruled, the, the Supreme Court ruled against his plan to build a settlement which turned out to be on, on private Palestinian land. The government didn't know it at the time. But when they found out they intended to continue anyway, the Supreme Court vetoed it, and Begin proudly announced, famously announced, Yesh Shoftim Yerushalayim. There are judges in Jerusalem. And he said this with pride, that we have judges who are ready to stand up to the government and veto government policy. Now his descendants in the Likud are going in exactly the opposite direction. Begin would not recognize his own party today. But there are enough, still, enough liberal right-wingers, what I would call nationalist liberals, which is an oxymoron in an American context, but in Israel is very much part of Zionist history. And that I believe that it is still possible to cobble together a majority coalition that will include parts of, uh, of the soft right, as it does today, by the way. You know, Gidon Saar, um, Naftali Bennett, for that matter, these are people who came literally out of Netanyahu's office. They were his closest allies, and they broke with him. They're still right wing. So this is not, Netanyahu is trying to portray this as a left wing issue, and, and calling the demonstrators leftists, which is his code word for traitors. And what's happening out on the streets uh, is, is, has, has simply made his, 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 his maneuver, in this case, uh, just ludicrous.
Well, let's stay with Prime Minister Netanyahu. Must we? So, <clears throat> as unlikely as this is, if the Prime Minister were to announce on Yom Ma'ut that in the interest of the country, he is indefinitely tabling the issue of judicial reform. If that were to happen, would we see large protests this Motzei Shabbat? Or would people stay home and say, okay, job done? We would see smaller protests, but still large ones. And the reason for that is that what's happened in the last few months is that the scope, the focus of the demonstrations has widened. In the initial stages of the protest movement, it was exclusively about saving the Supreme Court, the judicial system. In the last few months, there's the growing realization on the streets that we need to be addressing other systemic distortions in the Israeli system. I'm thinking about the ultra-Orthodox state within a state which this government is substantially strengthening, the separatist state within a state, uh, the rise of settler violence, which I once regarded as a fringe phenomenon and really dismissed it. And after Hawara, which, which saw hundreds of settlers uh, burning dozens of Palestinian homes to the ground, and the political patrons of the far fringe of the settlement movement are now sitting in the heart of the defense establishment because of this government. Ben Gvir and Smutrich, simply inconceivable five months ago. We can't say that that's a fringe phenomenon anymore. And so these are issues that I, as a centrist, are, are obsessed with now. And you, fee, you hear the changes on, on the streets from week to week, the, the speeches, the focus is expanding, and there's this sense do you know, you know what the, the slogan of the demonstrations is? The, slogans is one word. the slogan is one word, Busha. Busha means shame or disgrace. And that sums up the sensibility of what we're feeling. And the disgrace is not only the assault against an independent judiciary. That was the trigger. But the disgrace as well is having Ben Gvir, whom the army wouldn't draft because they didn't trust him with a gun, now is in charge of the Israeli police and has been granted his own, what is effectively a private militia by the government. The disgrace is a prime minister who is on trial for three charges of corruption, arrogating the right to interfere in the judicial system, to initiate the most far-reaching changes in the judicial system in the history of the state that any government ever, ever initiated. And, and, and let's not call this judicial reform. This has nothing to do with reform. This is a revolution. A prime minister on trial has no right to make, the, to, from my point of view, has no moral right to make the slightest changes, even justified changes. You are not permitted to touch the judicial system. And to make these kinds of deep changes, so the bouchard, the disgrace, is not just the assault on the judicial system, it's, it's, it's having a, fa a finance minister saying that the, 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 the mistake that the, that the rioters in Hawara, in the Palestinian village of Harawa, made was that that should have been left to the government to do. It's the government's job to erase a Palestinian village 
from, from, from the earth. That's the busha. <clears throat> but there's also a fear factor. I mean, one of the, one of the uh, slogans that's shouted is, Yariv Levin, Kanze Lopolin. Yariv Levin, here is not Poland. This is not Poland. Help us understand what they're saying. What does that mean? So first of all, Yariv Levine is our justice minister, and he's the one who is leading the, uh, the judicial revolution. And when we look around for precedent at what's happening in Israel today, we look to Poland and Hungary, which were countries that after after the traumas of, of, of 50 years of communism uh, were uh, finally granted democracy and then lost it, lost it over the last recent years. And it recently came out that um, the government consulted with the Polish government on how do you go about, how do you go about turning a democracy into what they euphemistically call in Eastern Europe today illiberal democracy. There's no such thing. And it turns out the government is playing by that playbook. So for example, uh, one of the, the suggestions uh, that, uh, what, what, one, of, one of the plans that this government uh, hopes to do is lower the, uh, the ages of the uh, Supreme, the, the retirement age of Supreme Court justices. That's the first thing that they did in Hungary when, when Orban was transitioning from a democracy to an autocracy. The playbook is there. And so Yariv Levin, Kanzelo Polin, uh, this is in Poland and this is in Hungary because Israelis are not Poles or Hungarians. Uh, we don't take things sitting down. And the same passion and love and protectiveness with which Israelis go to war when we have to, to defend the country from external threats, is being applied on the streets. And that's where Netanyahu miscalculated. He thought this was going to pass quickly. We're going to steamroll these changes through, and the country will, there'll be some protests, and, and everyone will eventually return to, to um, to daily life. And what we've seen is that from week to week, the protests are getting stronger. And that's why, so when we say that this is in Poland and this is in Hungary, what we're saying is the demonstration, and we're also looking at the demonstrations that happened in Poland and Hungary, because initially there was a liberal uprising in the streets, but it very quickly dissipated. And I can tell you, we're not going anywhere. And the moment when I realized that Khan Lopolin was the first big demonstration in Tel Aviv. Some of you may recall the, demonst the, the demonstration with the umbrellas. It was the first big one. And there were thousands of umbrellas because it was a downpour. We don't have, usually that kind of rain in Israel is rare. And I have never in my life been so wet standing under an umbrella. And I didn't realize at the time how drenched I was because I was so obsessed with, with and this was still raw, this was the beginning. I, I couldn't believe what they were doing. And it was only later when I thought back to that night that I realized what was so extraordinary was you had, I think there were 90,000 at that first demonstration. Nobody moved. Nobody left, nobody, nobody, nobody even, even commented on, on the downpour. There was this sense of we are fighting for Israel's life. And that's the moment, I think, in retrospect, that this movement was born. And that's the moment when we knew that we're not going to, to, be, to be Poland. So everything that you're saying points against compromise points against finding some sort of balanced approach to judicial reform that the Israeli populace will 
except, so are we on the verge of civil war? Look, we need genuine reform. A strong majority of Israelis agree with that. Most of the opposition agrees with that. We need reform in several ways. Uh, there needs to be uh, restraint in the reach of the court. The court is the most activist court uh, in, in the world. I think that there's, a, a, there's good reason for that. I don't think this was a power grab. I think that's where the critique of the right is wrong. I think that the court was desperately afraid of, given the absence of a constitution in Israel, uh, given the fact that we only have uh, one parliamentary house, uh, the court felt they were the last resort for, de for, for defending democratic norms. But when you overreach, you inevitably create antagonism. And to some extent, the antagonism was earned. The other piece of this, which is, to my mind, a scandal, is the fact that the court is homogeneous ethnically. You only have, out of 15 Supreme Court justices, you have two Mizrahim. Mizrahim are a majority of the country today, Jews from uh, Arab countries, Muslim countries. And um, so we need, we need much more diversity in the court. Here again, though, ideologically, I think that the critics on the right uh, are, um, are not giving the court enough credit in terms of its ideological uh, diversity. This is not the Supreme Court of, of Aaron Barak of the 90s. Uh, if, if, if the government uh, does not change the ground rules and uh, the process of seniority uh, remains in terms of how, how the, the Supreme Court Chief Justice is chosen, then next year the Supreme Court Justice, Chief Justice, will be a settler from Ofra. Did you know that, Jack? <laughs> So, this is not, this is not the, the, the caricature of the Supreme Court that the right is, is presenting. Something has changed. Not enough, admittedly, but we certainly don't need the government's heavy hand to, uh, to choose who the next Supreme Court Chief Justice will be. Now, if you're asking me, about compromise. There are compromises, there are reasonable plans. Herzog put a plan on the table, the government rejected it out of hand. Now, I didn't like Herzog's compromise. I was ready to live with it. But if for the government, that's not even a starting point, I don't see the basis. I think they're going through the motions, the government is, tr is buying time, they're hoping that the energy on the streets will dissipate, it will not. So if you're asking me, are we heading toward a civil war? That's a question if a civil war means violence. Right now we're in a kind of a cold civil war. God forbid a civil war of violence. The way that things have worked in Israeli society in the past is that the violence comes from one camp, comes right and moves, turns toward the left. This time, I think that the passions are so strong on both sides that I can't say that the violence will only come from one side. I, I, God forbid. But that's my, my fear. And um, it's one of the things that keeps me up at night. How is it that everyone in Israel feels like a victim? <laughs> such, a great, <laughs> such a great observation. Everyone you talk to is being victimized. We're a very small country, and we're a pressure cooker. And we are in a gathering of Jews from a hundred different, literally a hundred different countries. Every diaspora that returned to, to Israel came with a very specific idea of what a Jewish state is supposed to be. Is it a state of the Jews? Is it a state of Judaism? If so, what kind of Judaism? Is it a liberal state? What does that mean? And I came, I, I grew up in America. I brought my values of the community that raised me. 
I, I'm a product of the 1960s. And I brought those values to Israel. And it's not a coincidence that I'm sitting at the Hartman Institute or that the Hartman Institute was founded by an American rabbi. So that's, that's, that's my vision of Israel, is, is the Hartman vision, liberal Israel. I have friends who come from very different family experiences, either from the Middle East or from the former Soviet Union, whose idea of, 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 of an Israel is, is we're besieged. We don't have time for these democratic niceties. That's for, that's for Canada. That's not for, that's not for a country under siege in the Middle East. And I understand them. And they have a point that has to be listened to. And one of the things that I've learned in Israel was that no one part of the Jewish people has all the answers. So that's, that's one piece of it. Where we come to your observation, and it's such a perfect, perfect way to put it, is that I believe that if you threaten my Israel, you're not just threatening my Israel, you're threatening Israel, because my way is the way to guarantee Israel's well-being, and more, Israel's survival. If Israel is in a democracy, we're going to lose the United States, we're going to lose, if not you, your children. And that's an existential threat. So I see preserving Israel as a democratic Jewish state as as, as essential to Israel's survival. I'm, I'm out on the streets not only to protect the soul of Israel, but I believe to actually protect the viability of Israel in the long term, and in other ways too. Because if Israel, if we become an, if we become an autocratic society, we are going to lose hundreds of thousands of, of Israelis, and they will be coming from that part of Israel that has made us a successful modern state. They will be coming from startup nation. That's where the emigres, because they have somewhere to go. They have some, some they, 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 they can find work in Australia. They can come here. And so I see saving Israeli democracy and making sure that startup Israel remains in Israel as, as, an exit, as a matter of Israeli survival. Now, speak to people in the other camp, and they'll say, you leftists, you're threatening our existence here. You're threatening our existence because you want to withdraw from Judea and Samaria. You're going to leave us with an eight-mile-wide eight borders. We won't be able to defend ourselves. You want to destroy settlements, which are our homes, and so you are threatening Literally, you're threatening Chorban, a destruction of my Israel. I look, and, and, and there's a kind of a zero-sum game happening in Israeli society. And, and, and my Israel feels it in relation to the ultra-Orthodox. The ultra-Orthodox are growing exponentially. Now, as a Jew, I should be celebrating the fact that here are beautiful large Jewish families, and they are beautiful. I have family, Haredim, and they are, they are magnificent families. But they are threatening my Israel. They are threatening the limited resources of my Israel. They are threatening to undermine the, the most basic morale of our children who serve, because they don't serve. And how much longer is that going to last? How much longer are our kids going to want to be suckers, as, as Israelis are putting it now? So there's a zero-sum game here. And if I want to draft the ultra-Orthodox or, or force them into the economic mainstream, the ultra-Orthodox are saying, you are threatening our, our existence. You're threatening our lifestyle, which depends on being a separatist community. And they're right. We're also right. So everyone feels that the other camp is threatening my Israel. And so we, we're in a situation where, and there's something really pathological about it. Because instead of us celebrating the success of each other's Israel, 
we see each other's Israel as a threat. And I, I, I you know, I, I'm part of that too. I feel the same way about the other Israel. I feel that way about the settlements. You, you are, you are an annexing three million Palestinians to the state of Israel. And so I don't know how to navigate that. But the upshot is that each community feels itself to be the victim or potential victim of the other community. If your Israel is growing and, and becoming stronger, my Israel is endangered. That's the dynamic. Taxi. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> so let's, let's move on and talk about American Jewry. You did something that I think many of us were stunned by. I could say the same for Danny Gorders or Mati Friedman. You wrote an appeal to North American Jewry. And you are asking North American Jewry to come to the aid of Israel. In this letter, you said, we and our families, along with the many tens of thousands of other Israelis, are in the streets every week demanding the government end its war against our democratic values and institutions. We need your voice to help preserve Israel as a state, both Jewish and democratic. And when I read that letter, I responded. I, we, this congregation wrote letters, emails to the ambassador in New York, to our council general. But what is it that you think American Jewry can do in this moment? First of all, I'm very moved and gratified that that letter resonated and that you responded. That's couldn't ask for more than that. Uh, that letter was very much out of character for the three of us. Uh, it negated 40 years of what I've been basically saying to the American Jewish community. At least on the surface, it seemed to negate that message. And what I'm saying here tonight is I'm in a very different mode than I've been, well, the last time I was here, 10 years ago for sure. And I have never been in active opposition to my own government in Israel. I've lived through right-wing governments, left-wing governments, centrist governments. I've actually voted for all three kinds of governments over the years. And I always felt that every government represented me to some extent or another. Certainly every government was not just um, um, technically legitimate, but also morally legitimate. I don't feel that way today. Netanyahu spoke about the last government, the, the Bennett-Lapid uh, government, as, as uh, legal but not legitimate. I would say that's how I feel today. And, and at the most recent demonstration on Saturday night in Tel Aviv, uh, the former head of uh, the Shin Bet Diskin uh, said exactly that in his speech. He said, this government is, 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 is legal, it is not morally legitimate. A government that has Ben Gvir in charge of the police is not a morally legitimate government. Or, or where a senior minister calls for erasing a Palestinian village. That's not, that's, you don't, you do not represent me. And so that's the background to that letter. Uh, it was a, it was all three of us, um, it was Mati Friedman who, who approached uh, Danny and I. And as soon as he came up with the idea, we immediately realized this is what we have to do. We've been speaking for decades to the American Jewish community, writing to you. My audience is you. I've been writing to, to all of you for 40 years. That's, you're, you're the people who hopefully read me. And, uh, and, and, and so I felt a responsibility to continue trying to be as honest as possible in conveying to you 
what it's like being there. And, and what, I, what I felt when I made Aliyah was um, I felt like I was, in a way, one of the spies, the Israelite spies that, that, uh, that Moshe dispatched. Uh, I felt like my community was sending me to uh, send back dispatches. Like, what, what's it like in that crazy place? You know, it, it, this place, Israel, it means so much to us, and we really don't know what it is. We don't understand Israel. And I always felt that that was my responsibility as a, as a writer, to send back reports to all of you. And this was the report from 2023 Israel. But there was also an, 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 an additional motive, which you've, which you've rightly noted. I wasn't only reporting on what's happening, I was asking American Jews to take an active role in defending Israeli democracy. Now, I understand Israelis who say American Jews don't have the right to interfere or to lecture to us about security issues. I understand that argument. I'm not sure I agree with it, because I think if we take seriously the idea that that, that Israel is the nation state of the Jewish people. Uh, there is a price to pay. It doesn't only come with privileges. It's not only what you do for us, but we have a responsibility to, to, have, to have a seat at the table for the diaspora. And now President Herzog is trying to do something along those lines, very belatedly, but still. Uh, but on, on issues of democracy, who understands democracy in, in the world better than the American Jewish community? The leaders of your organizations are all lawyers. You're, 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 you are the most successful minority, not only in Jewish history, I think anywhere. Who, who, who is better able to tell us what is democratic and what isn't? And I'll give you an example, Alan Dershowitz, close to Netanyahu. Certainly, I did not expect to see him supporting the protest. Gave interviews in Israel and, and said, let me explain to you what the American system is. Because Netanyahu was saying, all we're doing here is trying to align the Israeli system with the American system. We're, we want to make Israel more democratic. And Alan Dershowitz came out and said, let me explain how democracy works in America. That's what we want. That's what we need as partners at this moment. We need the American Jewish wisdom and experience in, 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 in democracy. Uh, I have to tell you, Michael, I was so proud of, my, of the community that I come from. Uh, last night uh, at the GA, the Federation, meeting in Tel Aviv. I don't know how many of you saw this clip. It was all over Israeli social media. Uh, in the main hall of the GA, the big screen, they were showing the demonstrators who were out, outside the hall, the pro-democracy demonstrators, thousands of people. And as soon as their image flashed on the screen, there was a standing ovation. Almost the whole room. And that was the moment when I really felt, whether our letter had any impact or not, I just felt so proud of American Jewry. Because that's what we need is American Jews not to be protesting against Israel, but to be doing what we're doing in the streets in Israel, which is protesting for Israel. I would love to see large demonstrations outside of the Israeli consulates in major cities with thousands of Israeli flags. I want to see American Jews affirming the Israel that you love and believe in. You're, you have to protect that Israel as well. Because if, God forbid, we lose our democracy, it's going to impact on, on all of you. It's going to impact on how American society views, views the Jewish people, on the Jewish position in the West, on your children and grandchildren's relationship to Israel. This is, this is not just our fight. And American Jews, I felt, we, the three of us who wrote this letter, felt you have a responsibility 
to know the issues. You know, five months ago, I, had, I didn't know how many Supreme Court justices there were in Israel. I, didn't, I, 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 I always felt the less I know about the law, the better off I'll be, the happier I'll be. And, and today, we're all amateur experts. And there was this great joke that was circulating on Israeli social media uh, over Pesach, where uh, this guy writes, uh, I heard my neighbors shouting, this, the wife was shouting to the husband, you idiot, what do you know? In New Zealand, they choose judges by committee and not by parliament. And so this idea that your seder will be ruined because we're arguing over some minuscule detail of how in New Zealand they choose judges. And that's really what the discussion in Israel has become. We're looking at how they choose judges in Germany, in America, in New Zealand. And, and our appeal to all of you was help us through this. Help us understand what's wrong here. And I have to just say one last thing, and, and I have to own this. If I'm asking diaspora Jews of my camp to support us, I have to be willing to live with the fact that right-wing American Jews have the same right to intervene in our internal affairs. And, you know, in, in, Israelis play this kind of game, and we've done this for years. Diaspora Jews have no right to intervene in our internal affairs unless you're doing it on, on my side. <laughs> we, we love diaspora support, diaspora funding for my camp, but when you fund the other camp, how dare you? How dare you interfere and, 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 and undermine our ability to, to, to shape the Israel that, that's, that's the, the only Israel that can survive. So it's time for us to come back to, for, to, to, to re-examine some of the foundations of this relationship. This moment is an opportunity for a reset. And, and all these years, we've treated the diaspora as children. We're the grown-ups, and, and, and your job is, is just to support us and shut up. That's not tenable anymore, and it hasn't been for a while. This is the moment, and this is the issue, for us to really re reconceive the relationship. You wrote a beautiful book, Letters to My Palestinian Neighbor, where you imagined conversations across the wall from your porch in French Hill. And in your latest edition, you elicited responses from Palestinians. As your book draws to a close, you wrote, in these letters, neighbor, I've tried to convey to you something of why being Jewish and Israeli is so important to me, why I draw so much strength from the intensity of these commitments. And yet I try to remind myself that in the end, along with our personalities and achievements, the soul will leave all our mortal identities behind. So long as we walk this earth, we honor those identities and loyalties. But being a religious person also requires maintaining some relationship with our souls. What is our responsibility as religious people in a land sanctified by love and devotion? What is our responsibility as custodians of one of humanity's most intractable conflicts in the most dangerous moment in history? With people like Itamar ben Gavir, a man who for years had a picture of Boruch Goldstein on the wall of his home, now a minister in government heading his own version of the National Guard. What is your understanding? What's your message? When you speak to the imam at Duke University who co-directs the Institute's Muslim Leadership Initiative, what do you say about this moment in time? First of all, I don't remember writing that, so thank you for reading it to me. <laughs> you know, it's, it's this very strange process that when, uh, when you release a book, and, I've, and I, I think this is true for, for, for many writers, uh, you don't own it anymore. It's not yours. And I just never, I, I just, it's, it's like it's not, it's, it's gone for me. Yeah. It's a very strange experience because you, you live with a book before it's published with such intimacy. 
and it's just you and that manuscript, and then suddenly it goes public and it belongs to, I mean, there you found the passage that meant something to you. And I, I really don't remember that from the book. So, um, but okay, I mean, if you, I'll take your word for it. <laughs> um, you know, what I, what I say to, um, first of all, my, my approach in dealing with Palestinians and dealing with Muslims is non-apology. I don't apologize. I don't apologize for our failures. Uh, they don't apologize. They don't apologize to me for uh, the expulsion of a million Jews from Arab countries. I don't apologize. I, 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 I feel pain, but we're not, at the, we're not at the stage yet in this relationship where we can start apologizing because it'll be used against us. So when I talk about this government, and, and look, my, my position uh, on the government is public knowledge. My Muslim friends certainly know uh, how I feel about this government. But I also try to create some context for them. And I think of this government as the belated nervous breakdown of the Jewish people that we did not have after the Holocaust. One of the extraordinary achievements of the Jewish people is that we didn't have a collective nervous breakdown. And uh, there's an amazing um, article, uh, essay, that was written, uh, you might know it, by Chaim Greenberg in 1943. Chaim Greenberg was the leader of labor Zionism in America. And the essay was called Bankrupt. And he's writing about how the American Jewish community is failing to rescue the Jews in Europe. And then he has this line, which is just one of the most devastating lines that I think a Jew has ever written. And he said, the fact that the American Jewish community uh, has, mat has, has kept its mental health is perhaps the greatest sign of, of, its, of its mental disorder. And, um, and so the fact, though, that the Jewish people did not have a mass nervous breakdown. I grew up with survivors. I can tell you many of them were really not the most normal people on the block. And, uh, and yet, and yet, even as a community, the survivors um, led normal lives. And what happened in our families behind closed doors was a different matter. But publicly, the survivors were really part of the community, led, led, led extraordinary lives in many cases. So what's happening now is that it's caught up with us. It's taking political form. And look, I recognize this government. My background, I mean, you, you, you mentioned my first book, which is called Memoirs of a Jewish Extremist. I feel that my childhood has come to power 50 years later. You know, I was a follower of Mayor Kahana when I was a teenager. And, and I feel that, that the world that I grew up in and that spent a very long time trying to overcome has caught up with us. And here it is. And you can never totally overcome, you can never circumvent trauma. One way or another, suppressed trauma is going to come out. And this deep rage within part of the Jewish people, which we call the, the right or the hard right, that deep rage has understandable roots. That doesn't lessen my horror and it doesn't lessen the intensity of my commitment to push this back, but I certainly understand where it comes from. So when I speak to Imam Abdullah and Tepli, this is what I try to say. And, um, and look, you know, the Muslim world, they've got their own wounds and traumas and nervous breakdowns to deal with. So uh, it was a, uh, I believe it was a Jew who said, uh, um, let he who, uh, I forget exactly the phrase, cast the first stone. <laughs> so, you know, so when, when I speak with, with, with my Muslim friends, we commiserate. We commiserate. We're, 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 we're in deep struggles in our own 
in our own communities. Last question. You, Yossi, have done so much, but unexpectedly, you've done a service to the Jewish community through music. There's a beautiful article in today's um, Times of Israel, which I commend to everyone. And you wrote, there are various ways to trace the history of Israel through its waves of immigration, its wars, its transition from a nation of communal farms and shanty towns to a high-tech superpower. Hope you remember writing this. But what, helps, <laughs> but what helps define and bind those processes into an intelligible story is the music. Without it, Israel can seem incoherent, like the Hasidic story of a deaf man observing dancers at a wedding and assuming he was witnessing an outbreak of madness. As Israel turns 75 at such a dangerous, such a liminal moment, what is your playlist for Yom Ha'atzma'ut? Well, I'll tell you what I'm listening to now, and it's probably what I'll listen to on Yom Ha'atzma'ut. Uh, Initially, this is going to sound bad. So I'm, I'm, I need to say before I tell you what I'm listening to that it's not what it sounds like. But I'm listening to Holocaust music. <laughs> and it has nothing to do with the situation in Israel today. There's an album that just came out in the last week or two uh, for Yom HaShoah uh, called Paskol Shlishi, uh, the third soundtrack. And it is um, produced by some of Israel's leading young musicians who got together in the last few months. They, they secluded themselves on retreat and wrote what I think are some of the greatest songs uh, that I've heard in years. Shamat? It's amazing, ama amazing album. And, and what makes this not a Holocaust album, it's not about that. It's about us in relation to that. It's about Israeli society today. It's about how we live with that. And what do we remember? How do we remember? Uh, some of it is joyful. Some of it is a celebration. Um, some of it are stories of survivors. They sat together in, on retreat with, with 90-year-old survivors who told them their stories, and, they, and then they wrote songs about these stories. It's just something extraordinary. And, um, and it is so uplifting. And I really urge all of you to, uh, to, to go. It's called Pas Pascal Shlishi, uh, the third soundtrack, because of the, it's the third generation responding to, to the Shoah. And um, one song is better than the next. So uh, Israel is a pretty counterintuitive place, and I guess my... my playlist is, is a little counterintuitive for Yom Ha'atzma'ut, but I, I hear these songs as the affirmation, the expression of, uh, of the best of, of who we are. Yossi Klein Alevi, I am so grateful and feel very honored that in my 40th year here at An Shemet that you came here in person to be with us. It means so uh, totally a great deal mutual, to Michael. me Thank you. on a personal level. But I know that everyone here has been enriched by this conversation, has learned a great deal. And as we always do when we hear you or read you, we see a different perspective. We appreciate Israel from the eyes of a person who chose to live there because he's an Ohev Yisrael. And that permeates everything that you write. Oh, thank you. And sitting with you, feeling your passion, I think gives all of us a sense of the direction forward. And in moments like that, like this, that is all you can ask for. So I ask all of us to share our thanks to Yossi Klein Halevi.
um, and mazal tov to you and for this extraordinary achievement that, uh, that you've built. Thank you for all you do. Thank you so much. Lila Tov, everyone. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.